Well, I really don't know what I'm saying. But I'm Bentley, I'm a physics student at Jesus, I'm in my third year, and I'm from Australia, and I think Ilya actually only cares about me because I was on the Australian team for the International Physics Olympiad. I'll say that is true, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah, thank you very much for coming. I've got some questions for you, including some I've collected from Instagram. Tell us a bit about your course. Right, so I'm I'm studying natural sciences at Jesus and I'm doing physical natural sciences. So I'm in my third year, I'm studying physics at the moment. And the natural sciences course at Cambridge, it lets you choose a bunch of different options in your early years. So in first year, I did physics, chemistry and computer science and mathematics. Um, I was so bad at chemistry, but let's just push that aside. Um, in my second year, I did physics and maths. And then this year, I'm doing pure physics and uh, I'm taking some theoretical physics modules. So. That's fun. Many people have asked me to uh, ask you about how the international application process works, like uh, when did you apply and stuff like that, just how it works. Yeah. So the international um, application process is very similar to the UK process. Um, the difference is you do need to register for UCAS yourself. So I think, I don't know exactly what happens in the UK, I assume your school registers you. But yeah, you do need to take that extra initiative to um, you, so you can do, there's two types of applications you can do. So your school can register as an international school through UCAS and then you can sign up through them or you can register as like an independent, you know, independent person registering to UCAS, um, independent from your school. So yeah, I think other than that, the application process is pretty much the same. You have an option for when it comes to, for, to Cambridge, you have an option of where you want to interview. So I'm from Australia, unfortunately, they don't send out people to Australia anymore to interview. So I, was, I had the option of either flying to Singapore to interview or um, coming to Cambridge. So I ended up coming to Cambridge in the end because my grandparents are in York. But yeah, depending on what country you're from, it's quite common for um, Cambridge to send out interviewers to different countries. So um, you can often do the interview from your home country. And then with this year, with video interviews, um, with the whole COVID thing, who knows what that would be like. Um, so I, there was quite a few people from my school applying, so my school signed up um, to the U, to UCAS, and um, yeah, I applied through school. Um, so that just means if you apply through school, it's easier for them to put your references through. Um, and if they need to send any extra information through, then they can do that and they can check your application to make sure everything's all right. What was your interview like? Um, <laughs> so I had two interviews. Um, the first interview was not spectacular. <laughs> The, in my first interview, they asked me, they were, they were like, okay, so now we're going to do some organic chemistry. And I was kind of like, oh shit, I've never actually done much chemistry before. And chemistry is not particularly my strong point. So that was fun. I got there in the end. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and the second interview was mostly physics stuff. So I felt a lot more comfortable there. But um, yeah, the first interview was a bit interesting. But yeah, it was mostly all right. So was it all like scripted questions or did you think like specifically like you? Right, so I think, so for example, one thing I did mention was being interested in Lagrangian dynamics, which are a certain, um, a certain formulation of the laws of physics. And there was one question the interviewer asked me which kind of related to that. But other than that, I think they were mainly standard questions, which um, they asked, they asked everyone. Um, but yeah, there might have been a few specific questions tailored um, towards me based on what if I mentioned in my personal statements. What do you study in school? Like, I'm not sure how the Australian system is, like, I guess in general, ALs. Yeah. What kind of stuff do you study in preparation? Yep, so in Sydney, we have the um, HST, the high school certificate. In Sydney, everyone has to take English, which is not correct, but whatever. It's okay. It wasn't my worst subject by far at all. Yeah, so we all had to do English, and I also took physics, chemistry, because obviously natural sciences. And then I also took a music course, and um, mathematics extension one and extension two so yeah that was fun but um yeah i suppose as a natsuki um anything maths physics chemistry they're the main they're the main ones they're looking for mm -hmm. unless you're doing bio natsuki like no nah, that's gross how did you prepare for the interview and the other interview tips you do that i think the most important thing when preparing for the interview would be like i didn't do terribly much preparation but i think knowing your like content from school in terms of physics and maths is quite important um, because they do ask you technical questions um, so it is quite important you're on top of that content. I remember I did look at a few like you know everyone has the oh I'm a YouTuber I post videos about um, my Cambridge application process so you can get kind of a feel for what the interview is going to be like so I know a lot of the questions I 
saw were like graph sketching questions, which I didn't get asked about. So yeah, that seems to be a common thing in past interviews, ask you questions about graph sketching. So I did practice that a bit, but mostly it's just being on top of your content. I also, I did look over my personal statement to make sure I could elaborate on any points I made, but yeah, they didn't actually end up asking me much about my, my personal statement. It was mostly, um, mostly technical. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is of course the International Physics Olympiad. I knew very little about all these international science Olympiads when I was at school, so can you kind of tell us what is the International Physics Olympiad? Yeah, so the International Science Olympiads are a bunch of competitions run every year, apart from this year, that's COVID. Each country, in the case of the Physics Olympiad, each country selects five participants. And then I went to the Asian Physics Olympiad in Yakutsk in Siberia. And I went to the International Physics Olympiad in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. The main process for me, in, Aust in Australia at least, so there's this group, Australian Science Innovations. And in August, we sat a kind of test at school, which it's basically a qualifying exam. So the idea is we sit this test, it's kind of supposed to challenge you and push you outside the limits of questions you'd normally encounter at school. Um, the idea is that from there, the top 24 people um, get chosen to go to this um, summer school. For us in Australia, that was in uh, early January. And um, it was about a two-week summer school where we got to meet a whole bunch of other physics, physics students from around Australia. And um, they taught us a quick overview of first year and maybe early parts of second year physics. Um, so we kind of have a well-rounded base in physics. So throughout we sat, we did some labs as well. And in the end, we sat an exam to kind of try to consolidate slash test everything we did. And then in the case of us in Australia, so the top eight from there were chosen to go to the um, Asian Physical Olympiad in, which for me was in Siberia. And then from there, the top five people go to the International Physical Olympiad. So it's quite a long process, but I really enjoyed it. I got to learn a whole bunch of cool, interesting physics things, um, which did help me um, when I came to uni because you know, a lot of the content was quite familiar to me. But yeah, and then we did get to compete in the International Physics Olympiad. There were some cool questions, some cool experimental questions. One involved a levitating magnet, which was quite fancy, which was used as an earthquake sensor. A lot of the questions are quite cool, and you do learn some cool physics things along the way. So I really enjoyed it, and I would highly recommend anyone get involved. Anyone get involved. But yeah, the process is different in different countries, so um, you should check to see what country specific things. Were you saying you prepared for it intentionally or you just kind of tried it? Um, so I was lucky in the sense that my school had some extra lessons um, outside after school on, on an afternoon to kind of prepare for that qualifying exam. I know a lot of, a lot of schools don't, um, but I know in the, case of, in the case of Australia, Australian Science Innovations is really trying to push schools to kind of do that, to, you know, have some kind of extra education beyond the normal curriculum. I don't know what the case is like um, in different countries or in different schools, but um, yeah, some schools do try to have these extra preparation classes and other schools don't. So yeah, I was fortunate enough that my school did, but um, yeah, I think a lot of people just wing it and mm -hmm. see if they get in. If someone doesn't have access to like help from school, how would you recommend they can prepare for the physics center? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think, um, Honestly, I think I would have struggled to prepare for it without help from teachers at school. Um, there are quite a few past papers online from, for, for, for whatever country qualifying exams um, you're looking at. So they're always helpful. But yeah, I would recommend there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos out there. Um, so if you kind of look over some of the past paper questions, look over what kind of things you need to learn, um, get on top of basic mechanics, so basic forces and how that kind of stuff works. You should be prepared well. And of course, if you've teached the school who are willing to give you some extra time to help or go through um, questions, then you know that's very helpful. I found discussing things with teachers um, was particularly helpful. I know you've done very well academically. I remember someone said in the first year in a mock exam, the average was like 40% and you got, was it 93%? It was 94, but sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, 94. Uh, so other than like being naturally born genius, do you have any study tips? <laughs> study tips. That's a very good question, but um, yeah, so I think I really like to make notes on stuff. I find that helps me learn the content quite well. I always feel like if I can explain the content to someone, whether a real person or an imaginary person, I'm, I'm not weird, I swear. If I, if I can explain the content to someone, then, you know, I find that's a good indication of 
whether I understand it well. So I feel like help making notes really helps me make sure, you know, if you if putting it into words makes you realize where you don't understand things properly. And then if you find a friend who's not sure on, who's not quite sure how an idea works, you know, if you explain it to them, or if not, you come up with an imaginary friend um, and explain it to them, then yeah, I find that does help kind of consolidate information. I think that would be, that's what my general study process is like. And yeah, I found it quite helpful. I don't know if you know the channel, um, is his name Simon Clark? He was a physics student at Oxford, Simon somebody. Um, he said he would talk to his dead dog about what he learnt, um, which is kind of cute. Um, so yeah, whatever works for you. But yeah, I feel like explaining things to people does really help. Uh, those are the main questions I had. And there's some questions I got from Instagram. But the first one I thought was quite interesting is, uh, are you Spanish? <laughs> yeah, I'm Spanish. Bonjour, baguette, baguette. Croissant, croissant. Oui, oui. Yeah, I should have a the Spanish hat. You know that meme with like the, the doggo with like the Spanish hat? <laughs> <laughs> Next one is what papers do international students need and I think maybe they need visa or something like that. Not oh okay. Um, yeah so I'm not actually sure because I'm lucky in the sense that I'm a dual Australian British citizen um, so I didn't need visas but um, Generally, the university will help sponsor a, I think it's tier, tier four student visa, I think that's what they usually call it. Um, so you'll, you'll need to apply for that. Depending on what country you're from, you may need to take a, um, an English test to make sure like your English is up to standard. Um, but yeah, I think generally the universities would be, they'll be all right with sorting everything out. So because you have a British passport, does that mean you pay British fees or international fees? So yeah, unfortunately I don't. Um, yeah, I, so the criteria for paying local fees are you have to be a British citizen and you need to be in the UK for your last three years of high school. And by high school, I mean high school slash sixth form um, because the UK system is weird. Um, so I was in Australia for my last three years of high school. So because of that, I'm not eligible for local fees. Um, so international fees are quite a bit more expensive. I think the local fees are 9.25K, something like that. So international fees for physics, I think are 28K a year. Um, and then it varies per subject, so I think it varies from anywhere from like 20k to up to 50, 60k for medicine, which is like a lot. So yeah, poor medicine international students. Um, and then on top of that, international students have to pay a college fee. Local students don't have to pay a college fee at all, but international students have to pay, I think for me it's 9k a year. Um, for the year below, I think it's 9.5k and then it goes to 10k or something like that. So it seems to be increasing quite quickly as the years go on, which is not great. But it does mean it is a fair bit less accessible. And then of course, British students are eligible to student loans through Student Finance England and international students aren't. So it does make the whole thing of like, you know, you like the university does do quite a lot to try to make Cambridge accessible for British students who um, aren't from particularly wealthy families. The problem with international students at the moment is it's very hard to afford the Cambridge, or not just Cambridge, any international British uni fees um, without some kind of financial support from family or anyone. Um, so there are a few scholarships, but they're only available to students who wouldn't be able to come to Cambridge otherwise, which is fair enough. Um, and there's very few, so they're very competitive. But generally, it's quite hard to get funding for an undergraduate degree um, at Cambridge as, as an international student. Um, I think postgrads have, do have it a bit easier, but I don't know anything about applying for postgrad things. So international means non-EU at the moment. I feel, I, I'm not sure exactly what's happening. I think with Brexit, EU students next from next year are classified as international. I'm not sure, you might want to double check that. But um, that means if you're an EU student looking to apply to Cambridge, then you will have to pay international fees, sadly. But I know, so for example, it might be worth, if you are interested as an international student looking to come to Cambridge, I know some countries do do some kind of student loan funding. So I think America, they have, I mean, American university fees are ridiculously expensive anyways, but um, they do allow you to take out a loan um, to cover international fees. I know, I know in Australia that hex, the HEX system doesn't allow you to, but yeah, it's worth checking with your country and seeing um, what, what 
what worms they have available. This is the last question I have. It's a hard thing to get for It's piss easy, anyone could get in. Um, <laughs> nah, so, I mean, I mean, I do feel like, as an international student, there are, there are extra barriers to get into Cambridge in the sense that, like, in the sense that, you know, from, if you're not, so, for example, from being from Australia, you need to travel to either Singapore or um, Cambridge to interview. I think Oxford do Skype interviews and that might actually be changing because of COVID, you know, they might decide, or oh, we can actually do, um, we actually can actually do video interviews um, going into the future. Um, but in terms of, you know, like there is an extra barrier to um, having to go out of your way to apply to British unis. Um, so in that sense, it is, you know, more effort. Um, personal statements wise, that's also effort. And then like often the admissions tutors, they often don't know what your grades actually mean, so you might need to explain that. But yeah, I feel like, you know, academic wise, it's like the the academic barrier to getting into Cambridge is probably quite similar to like with international students and British students. Um, but yeah, in, in summary, it's piss easy. <laughs> That's all the questions I have for you, but is there anything else you'd like to say? In, uh... Anything I'd like to say? Um, just subscribe to Ilya's YouTube channel. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Am I famous now? Is that how it works? Yeah, you're now famous. I'm now famous. Okay, cool. So I expect paparazzi. I don't want paparazzi. Fuck that shit. Bye. Is it recording? No, 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 no. Oh, okay.